and I'm going to be showing you some from the past. One of the things I've been involved with uh, my fly tying career is setting up fly tying theaters and been involved with the many conclaves that fly fishing groups and clubs have over the country. And they uh, really highlight tires that you may not have ever met. And one of the best ones is ones in Idaho, both the Western Idaho Expo and the uh, Eastern Idaho Expo, which is in Idaho Falls. Uh, they've been doing these fly tying get together for a long time. We're talking over 30 years. So I want to do some highlights from some that I filmed in 2009 and 2010. And you will get a chance to meet some names you know, and some, maybe some names you didn't know. And one of the nice things about tying at these expos is all the uh, excitement and sounds of people going around telling lots and lots of fly fishing stories. Most of them may be exaggerated. But one of the nice things about the theater is you get a chance to listen to the tires talk about it, their experiences uh, and, and answer questions. I, I think you're going to enjoy them. Uh, we're going to start this uh, week with uh, uh, several. Uh, we'll try to give you the most information. And I know some of you are going to say, wow, you know, I don't know about the materials. Well, these are really uncut. So, you know, you do your best on figuring it out. But I think you're going to enjoy the interaction uh, with the crowd and with the tires. And really, uncut un and, I think, extremely fun. Let's get going. Okay, here we go. Okay, my name is Jeff Smith. Um, I will hope maybe not to show you so much about how to tie a specific fly, but I'm going to show you a few things I think people miss, and I'm going to try to cover a couple things that I get asked questions about an awful lot. Um, it, it's pretty obvious you can't tie any fly without you know good thread control. You've got to be able to make a good thread base what starts your fly off it's what makes a pretty fly um, floss bodies are brutal to a lot of folks a lot of people just shy away from floss bodies for for a multitude of reasons but a lot of times it's just because they can't make them pretty they come out lumpy and bumpy uh, the, the, the material I'm going to start off using here is a stretch nylon it's a multi-filament nylon and it stretches down into a real fine flat material and it doesn't twist very easily. All threads will twist as you wrap them around the hook and one of the things you'll run into as you wrap over the hook like this, every time I go around that twists down. Well now you can see that's twisted pretty pretty tight and what I do and I get a lot of questions about this. See my, my bobbin wants to spin. One of the things I do is I set and tie is I'll just give my bobbin a spin like that and I go on time. Well that flattens my thread out. And I just have, by habit, started doing that over the years, and it continues to allow me to lay flat bases down. Now this particular base right here, what I'm going to do is tie a tag on this fly of this hot, hot green. I'm going to put something under it, rather than a material over the top of it. And I want this tag to build up a little bit for me, so that it has some bulk to it. I'll wrap that forward, keeping my wraps jammed tight one up against the other. And I'm going to take this Mylar tinsel, wrap underneath that. The color shows through from underneath. And I'll wrap back over it. With nice flat wraps. Now when that floss gets wet, it'll, it'll almost glow like a neon light. It's amazing how this looks in the water. And what I did by wrapping that tinsel under there was gave it something underneath other than the black of the hook. And even, even a non-black hook 
will show black through a light material like this. Now, that I don't believe that's always a bad thing. I truly don't. Um, I think there, there's merit to having that black dorsal line down some flies, uh, particularly on streamers and whatnot. Now, I'm going to just spiral that up and get ready. I'm going to go to a white 6 aught. And the reason I tie with a lot of white is if I wind up going to a lighter material, I don't have black thread thrown, showing through my material. Now at this point, I'm going to tie in a rib, and I'm going to use it as a counter rib to bind down my hackle, if I can get it off the spool. This is one of the things people talk about. Uh, their, their first attempts at tying spay flies, one of the things they find most difficult is making them durable. Well, the durability issue comes in with this counter rib. We're going to wrap over the, it's going to crisscross backwards over our uh, hackle wraps, and that's going to hold down that, that hackle for me. Now, for a uh, for a body on this, I'm using simple embroidery floss. It lays flat. It doesn't give you try. Uh, I'm in the construction business, and I build saddles, and my hands are rough all the time. I love silk floss. There's nothing I'd rather tie with when I'm tying presentation flies, when I'm tying flies to put under glass. I always use silk. It just looks better. But I have a heck, I have to either wear silk gloves, or I bring this little tool, and I sand my fingers down with it. Uh, I, I found that to be a little more forgiving than my Makita grinder. It got a little carried away and caused additional problems. Um, you, you just have to do something to handle that silk. It's so, so catchy. You know, it's like being next to Velcro. And what I do with my materials on this is I start my body floss under the hook. <coughs> and I can turn this vise towards me position that under the hook and then I turn it back out there where you guys can see I tight that directly underneath the hook and that keeps me from getting a lump or a bump on either side of the of the fly keeps my body really uniform from what we hope to be the perspective of the fish what we, what we want this fly to do is to travel through the water upright with the hook acting as a keel and that's one of the reasons most all of your spay flies will be reduced a little bit and what I mean by reduced your your old rules of fly tying said you started your body right at the barb. Well, you redu reduce this down and start it at the point or even a little bit in front of the point, and that allows the weight of that hook to be a keel under that fly and keep it upright in the water so your hook rides right. If you ever notice a fly, you, you, you'll, you'll tie a fly or get your hands on a fly somewhere that you put in the water and it wants to turn over upside down. It's probably a weighted body fly. It's not all bad. It doesn't make it bad if it does get in the water. But steelhead fishing in particular, if you're swinging that fly through the water, your chances of foul hookups go up exponentially with that fly upside down. Because your leader will swing under a fish, that hook will drag by and you'll snag him every time. Whereas with the fly in the right perspective, as it swings under, your chances are much reduced. Um, there again, not that that's always a bad thing. Maybe the only pull you get all day long, too. So... I'm not going to say. Uh, this fly is, the, the, the pattern itself is realistically a green butt purple king. The purple king is an old spay fly that if you look in, in some of the books that have come out in the past few years, uh, was very, very popular and it, the, the color scheme I think it's kind of been forgotten. Purple's still good. Purple's still one of those colors that people jump all over for steelhead, and we should. Um, but purple and brown. It's, it's a kind of an iridescent brown. This is a piece of chicken tail. It's called a couche tail. Um, there was a number of years where we couldn't find these. Had a heck of a time finding these. The best ones I found that I could buy were to go to cleaning supply places and buy feather dusters and take them apart. And, I find, and you could get from from a black like this to the browns all in one and I pick through them and high grade them you know well, now there's coos tail available you can buy it uh, Hoffman uh, Whiting Hackle has, has some, some really good 
spay hackle out there that's very available. Actually, it's better than a lot of this. If you can see, this has a fairly coarse stem on it. And those stems can give you trouble sometimes. They're on something this big, the stems are never round. They're always almost flat or rectangular. And when you go to tie, if you've ever noticed on hackle, it doesn't have a round stem. It wants to roll over. These are really, really guilty of that. They do it, do it really bad. But it, it's what we deal with. I'm going to tie my hackle in just on the opposite side. Oops. Never did that on TV before. Now the embroidery floss is very close. If you read in some of the Spayfly books, uh, They had some wools, uh, cruel wool, and some other old wools that were readily available then that aren't so available now. Uh, you can find them once in a while in yarn shops, but they're pretty tough to come by. This embroidery floss comes really close. One of the things you can do with it, if you want to tie smaller stuff, um, you can split it. It's easily split because each one of these strands is lightly twisted, so they're not all bound together. Um, it works great. I've got a multitude of colors of it. Uh, Caddis egg sacks. This green's a good caddis egg sack. Throw it on there. Um, there's, gosh, the, the sky's the limit, and you can get it in any color. They, they've got a, a good olive color that's almost a peacock olive, like that thread right there. That, that's a Danville's peacock olive thread. You can get this embroidery floss in, in the same color. It's, there's, it's amazing what you can do. And with this, I want to keep my body fairly slim, so I'll just keep it flat also. Every time I go over the top, I turn this thread back, I have to turn. Every time I go around the hook, I spin my bobbin or my, my material. It always rolls over and it twists. And if I were to twist this up, and there again, you can do some kind of cool things with this too. Now, twist that up and go around. And it almost gives me a segmented look. I don't know, does the camera show you that? Can you really see how it goes from flat to segmented there? That makes a great caddis larvae. You take this color or this material in a, in a caddis color, greens or browns or whatever it might be, and twist that and wrap it in that manner, and you get that real segmented, bumpy, wormy look that you get on a caddis larvae. This material, it's great. I, I can't say enough about it. But I want a nice flat body here, so I'm going to keep backing it up just a little bit. Try to continue nice and flat forward. out there and one of the things one of the things you'll you'll find and if you've tied if you learn to tie woolly worms and woolly buggers you already know this so I'm not telling you that you don't know if you tie a hackle in by the butt hackle stands up if you tie a hackle in by the tip or if you tie it in by the butt in the front and wrap backwards it flows to the back that's, that's really the difference between a woolly worm and a woolly bugger other than the tail, of, of course. But the, the hackle on a woolly bugger is tied by the, by the butt, wrapped to the back, or tied by the tip and wrapped to the front, and your hackle will cup or flow to the back. On a woolly worm, it's tied in by the butt in the back, and it stands up straight forward like this. And that, that's how originally the woolly worm was tied. Now this, I want that effect so I'm gonna wrap this around there trying to lay that big old stem I talked about carefully and if you buy this couche tail like I said I would recommend you buy the whiting or, or one better brand if you wind up trying to use dime store stuff like this um, sometimes it helps to soak it in a little water with a couple drops of glycerin in it and it kind of rehydrates that stem. Your stems won't be so brittle. They're a little easier to handle. Uh, that's true of old hackle. If you got some old stuff around that kind of got dried out, just take some tap water with a little bit of glycerin and get it at the drugstore. A few drops in that water and, and bathe that hackle in it. 
The stems will absorb that glycerin, doesn't hurt the feather a bit, and it's a lot easier to work with. Now this rib, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna run it backwards, the opposite way from my hackle. Called a counterwind. And it's really not as bad as you might think. You think everything gets all snagged up in there and caught underneath. If you just take your scissor points or a bodkin and work down through that once in a while, you don't bind down that many of them. What this will do is it'll keep those fish's teeth. It won't keep the fish's teeth from cutting your hackle, but when it does, it'll only come loose in a little segment. And it'll let you get a lot more hours of fishing out of a fly or a lot more fish out of a fly. And I've had people often question me on that, and I don't, and sometimes I wonder if it's worthwhile. Um, Honestly, to catch a steelhead, if I had to give up a flight every fish, it wouldn't hurt my feelings at all because I know how many hours I spent. It's not like I don't get to spend a little time tying flies. Now, that looks pretty ratty. And what I do, and it, this is almost politically incorrect, is I just lick my fingers and I kind of smooth that back and give it a little mash. For one thing, this helps me out as I do the rest of my fly. It also gives you a little better idea of what that's going to flow like in the water. But in softer water, that fly is going to hold up pretty well. In harder water, swifter water, it's going to pull back and, and halo that body just a little bit. You're still going to get that green butt showing through because we didn't wrap hackle over that. You're still going to get a little little bit of that purple center line in there, which purple is just, like I said, just a great color. Now, for a color on this fly, what I really like is widgeon flank and there again one of the things I, I told somebody when they uh, asked me to tie on their video theater one thing you guys will find is I'm probably the most disorganized guy you'll find but one of the things I don't like to do when I'm demonstrating flies to folks is I don't want to come with all my materials prepped and clean and taken care of because you miss out on that part. You might you might not see what I did beforehand. It, these are all off wild birds. These are from from ducks my son shot or I shot. Um, I, I don't fool around pairing feathers or anything at the time. And these don't need to be paired for a collar. This is just a, a simple wedge and flank. Now this one you can see it's actually already split part of it off the stem. And if you want to reduce this down, it's easy to do once that split. That peels right off the side. There's no no butt ends, no fibers left, no anything. It comes clean, right like that. And that, that'd be great, but it's the wrong side for what I want to do. If you can see, if I go to wrap over the top with that, it's going to go the wrong way. So I'm going to grab this other one here and hope it's not split. And it's not. It's complete. That's a whole feather right there. What I'm going to do is clean up the butt just a little bit, try to get down into the area. It's usually pretty easy on these colored ducks. You can see the stem doesn't get too thick until we're down in here where the color starts to change. Once that stem gets pretty thick down in there, it's a little harder to manage, particularly on wild birds. They, they are not, not known to have too round of stems or too good of quality stems. But that right there we can probably deal with. That's not too, not too bad. What I'm gonna do is tie this in by the tip Just pull back a little bit, clean away from the tip of the feather a little ways. And I try to get them pretty even so they're back away from the tip about like that. And it gives me plenty to tie down. There's, there's a little bit of that tip I can get a hold of there. I'm going to take that and tie it in right over here next to me. One of the things when you're tying in something by the stem like this, it's going to want to slip out. Particularly, I'm using an unwaxed thread. Now it's slick like silk and it will pull out gives you fits. So what I try to do is tie that in and then I just fold those few fibers right back in and they'll just get lost in my collar. You're never going to know they're there. Now I'm going to take my scissors and I'm going to fold this hackle. And on, on most of the scissors we get nowadays, one blade is slightly serrated. I don't know if you guys can see that. There's a, there's a serrated blade here and a smooth blade here. Do not try to fold with your serrated blade. <laughs> it's like trying to fold with an 
hacksaw. It doesn't work well. You want to, and it's there again, just have it. I've got to where I always put the smooth blade on my finger. And that way, when I flip it up, the serrated blade goes down. I've got the smooth blade up where I can use it to fold. And, and there again, that's just habit. I do it if I'm tying mayflies, even what, whatever it is. Now, I'll take that blade, and I'll pull on that feather just a little bit. Now, Mick, watch carefully. We've been working on this for a long time. And I'm just going to lay that on the stem, and I'm going to drag it back against that. And can you guys see how that breaks those fibers down and gets them to fold back away from them? Let's try that. Can you see what that did to those fibers? It just broke them away from the stem just a little bit, didn't remove them, didn't peel them off, just folded them away from the stem. Now what that's going to do for me is get them all to lay to the back and not be caught under the stem and go in odd directions. It makes them lay a lot nicer. And I'll just take this and wrap around here. And I tend, you'll, you'll look at, at pictures of spay flies and you'll talk to some spay fly dressers I'll tell you, my flies are way overdressed, and they are. They're not classic spay flies because I do tend to put a little more material in my flies. Uh, I think that's partly the kind of water I prefer to fish, partly the look I like on my flies. Um, there you can see all those fibers look correct now. They don't look like they're going off in a different direction. All those duck fibers look really correct. And that, that barred duck gives it a really nice kind of a halo effect around the front. Just just really encases that fly very well. For a wing, we're going to do bronze mallard. And to do this wing properly, you have to have a pair of feathers. One from the right of the duck and one from the left of the duck. And on your mallard, these will be under the wing, coming around on the back. You'll, you'll find them. They, they, look, they look very similar to the breast feathers, except they have this one bronze edge. These are wild birds. You can see, obviously, it looks to me like there's been about a number two shot go right through that spot right there. So... Once in a while you get that bass buff, that's okay. There's kind of a sweet spot in these feathers and that that is a good break point right there where that's at. What I do to prep these is I just peel this backside clean. You're not gonna use that. Peel away everything down here that's no good. You can see where the barring stops about here, just about where that splits at anyway. That's that's getting into an area you can't use too much. That stuff gets pretty pretty mushy, and it, it doesn't tie in quite right. They separate too much. They won't hold up. I'll go about here, and we'll try this bottom one and see what happens. There's one. You can get several wings out of one of these. You don't. You know, it's not just like you get one out of a feather. Pardon me while I clean this one up back here where it's a little easier for me. And that's one, some of the old fishing where there's October caddis you don't fishing dry is, is an awesome way to catch steelhead it's incredible to take steelhead dry however it does really limit the number of fish you're going to catch I usually like if I'm fishing when there's October caddis out I think orange is the way to go and if, if it's that time of year and they're in the water it's the way to go I'll go with this pattern it's going to look a lot the same, a little color changes and a little bit of subtle changes in how it's going to flow in the water. I'm going to do the same thing with the butt of this, it's just my mylar underneath that. You can use silver, uh, there's guys that swear at mylar and swear by metal tinsels. Um, I use a lot of metal tinsels. I find for most folks they're pretty tough to deal with. They break a lot, uh, your edges will cut your thread. There's a lot of things about what are truly good metal tinsels that are just, they, they take a lot of working with them to get them how you, how you want them to work. So, I, especially something that's gonna be under a base like this is, can't see the point in not using these plastics. They're really nice to use. They always lay flat. 
They give you a, a nice seal on that thread under there where you're not going to get the black showing through, like I said before. Plus, this top layer is going to really glow nice for us. When it gets wet, it's almost like a neon sign. If you're I don't, I, I choose not to. I do know guys who will coat the butts of these flies with a, uh, a cement of some kind. If I'm going to do anything on this to really toughen it, if I figure I'm going to be able to fish this fly all day anyway, which I very seldom ever do, I'll take my bodkin and a little bit of super glue and I'll just put a real thin line of super glue right down the top of the hook, right down the top of that tag. And then it, it's bulletproof. I mean, if it gets cut underneath, it'll just be a couple little threads sticking out each side. But given this, this stretchy nylon, you don't hardly have that problem because no fibers ever end. It's all nylon fibers throughout. Colors are consistent throughout. I'm going to use the same rib. It, and now that I, I said it early on, you see me spin that bobbin a lot. You can really see about now that thread starts looking pretty fine. I'll spin my bobbin back and it just got a lot wider and flatter. And that's what lays that body nice and flat. And one of the other cool things you can do with this iridescent, or this stretchy nylon rather, is your coarser dubbings, obviously everybody's looped up. Coarser dubbings are almost always better in a loop than they are in, in touch dub. They just don't touch dub well. You can take this nylon and split it. And this is a this is also a nylon material. It's called uh, seal dub. It's a it's a fake seal. You can get SLF. You can get real seal if you can find it. Anything like that makes a great dubbing for this particular pattern. You can do this. This is also how I tie my green butt skunks. Tie on my green butt and I switch to a black nylon like this. Now, I'm taking my finger out of here is usually where I drop a bunch. Not too much today. I have to clean it up a little bit. Bear with me. spin our bobbin until that thread starts to wrap up in a loop. And get your length right, it really goes easy. You can just turn him loose and let him go like that. And if you noticed, I bulked it up a little bit up here to what's going to be the front. I'm going to taper it out just a little bit here. Just a 22 caliber cleaning brush stuck in a little wood handle. I just take that, reach in there and rake that stuff out, rough it up a little bit. And I can shape that body just a bit, make sure it's exactly how I want it to be. Stand all that up to the front. This time this rib I'm just going to put in here the way you'd conventionally wrap it. Now that's one other thing you'll read in a lot of your salmon fly and, and steelhead fly books. 
the uh, old salmon fly dressers guild they were pretty crazy about some things you had to do a certain number of turns of tinsel you had to make sure you had the right number on there or the guild wouldn't certify your flies and then of course the king or the prince or the duke or whoever in the hell you were selling to wouldn't buy them so i've deviated from that i really don't care some is good if it looks right it looks right yeah i'm not i rake it out again to pull those ends out from under that back. Now I'm going to take a goose shoulder feather. And these are store bought. I've got a bunch at home that are from wild birds that I've done myself. These are just a little easier to deal with. Uh, I, I find that marriage goes a lot simpler for me the less things I die in my wife's kitchen. Uh, Mick knows this story quite well. Uh, worked at a fly shop here in Boise for a number of years, and uh, the guy that I worked for and I, we ran out of black marabou in the shop. And so we took all the olive and all the extra brown and all the stuff we could find, and we took all of our writ dye and our vinegar, and we dyed up a bunch of black marabou. We had to have it the next day, so I took it home. And I threw it in a pillowcase and I put it in the dryer. Red dye doesn't set real quickly and it will come out. And the inside of our dryer was really, really black and it came off on towels and ladies under things and other such as that. We were in a lot of trouble for a while about that. So I, I just find that buying some of my materials dyed is a lot simpler than doing it anymore. At least cheaper because I can't afford a divorce. Now I'm going to fold this just like I did before. See those fibers just break back away from the stem of that and they'll wrap down perfect every time for me. Particularly, you'll, you'll find this to be really, really important on these coarser stemmed materials. getting about to where that stem is going to break. You'll learn to kind of have a feel for that. Those stems will start feeling pretty washy on you like they're going to go. I just quit. <laughs> now, I'm going to change to my black. There again, just by twisting around that thread like that, I half hitched it four or five times to itself, and it, it's never going to come out from under there. And if you always do it on the bottom, particularly on these return loop eye hooks, you wind up with any lumps and bumps in your head on the bottom side, where when you build your head up, it looks nice. Now, what I'd like to put on there, find it, and I think it just did. Said, bear with me. This is golden pheasant crest or uh, tippets dyed a rusty orange. Now, I don't know if you've ever spent a lot of time up close, and this isn't really a microscope, but if you look real close at that golden pheasant, it's still got a lot of that shine to it that they have in natural state. Whatever color you dye them, they'll, they'll really take that on, but they keep that iridescent shine. And the cool thing we found about it and looking at it under a microscope really closely, these feather fibers are almost trilobal. They have flats on them, and those flats are like little mirrors. They reflect them. They, they really, really do a nice job in the water. Once they get wet, every one of them's got a little iridescent flash to it. I, I'm a huge believer in it. I think, honestly, uh, our forefathers that tied with a lot of golden pheasant learned some things that we probably should follow up on a lot more carefully than we do. Now I'm going to tie this in by the tip also, surprisingly. It's going to look a little funny to you when I do it. But I've stripped it back about that far and left so much tip out there. I'm going to tie this in, fold that tip back so that I've got 
a good secure tie-in point right there on top. I'm going to fold this guy back, and then I'm going to trim that off because that's going to leave a, a little clump there that's kind of going to look odd in my collar. Trim that off, and then I'll fold this just like I did the duck and goose. Just running my scissors across that, to fold them back. And you'll find some materials that are more difficult to fold than others. That one didn't want to go, so I'll grab it hold it out of the way. So I get that first one in there, then it goes pretty good, see? They lay right back over that. Just a couple, three wraps of that's plenty. It gives you just... head back just a little bit. Then you'll find when you're mounting these bronze mallard wings, be real conscious of, of what you're mounting them to. Uh, it's a foundation. Your thread and your build up under there is always a foundation for the next material that's going to go on. So we want a nice rounded plateau for those to set on top of. Just, just slightly rounded. The beauty of, of a return loop is you have a flat surface to start with, not just a round of the hook. And so I got, I've got a, a flat spot with just a little bit of a hump in the middle of it. And that's going to let those bronze mallard wings tent over there like I like them to. Now I'll use the same feathers as before. This one's the one that's got the hole in it already. I'm going to take it, separate that piece clear out. So I can't use the one with the hole in it, obviously. If you get these, like I say, especially using wild birds, and some you buy in the store, they'll they'll come split like that. He split out of them. Just take that and lightly stroke them back together a few times, and they'll marry right back together. And that's how you build married wings for a salmon fly. You take multiple fibers off of multiple feathers and you put them back together like they all came in one feather. And it's it's a daunting process sometimes, but that, that's all there is to it. These, these fibers all have little interlocking flue on the side of them, and as you stroke them back together, they'll interlock back together as long as they're relatively clean. And I, and I, I, don't, I don't have any kind of a rule on the width of my wing. I really don't. On this size one, I generally go about a quarter of an inch wide. I don't count fibers, I don't, you know, uh, if I'm building building a fly to put under glass that's that's really going to be scrutinized, I do count fibers, but on these bronze mallard wings, you would have to have a microscope to count your fibers. It's just a matter of getting them close and going with it. And those two aren't too bad, they're pretty close. Probably the one on my left is one fiber wider than the one on my right. Uh, I won't slash my wrists over that. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to cross those at the base like that, down about where the color changes. Get my tips pretty even. I'm going to set them right there on top, slightly onto my side. Hold them on there. Roll them to me just a little bit. Go over the top with a fairly soft loop. Over the top with one a little firmer and tie them down. And those went on really good. I'll quit now. Yeah, those went on nice. See, they rolled in there real nice. There's a nice back on them. They held together well, didn't bust apart. Get them centered up pretty good. Start building my head just a little bit here. Same deal. I'm going to switch scissors real quick. Go to these super sharps and get in and cut those butts off. See if I can get them close enough to suit me. That head's not looking too bad. I'm not going to do too much more to that one. 
Usually I swing them, yeah. Yeah. I'm a little weird. I'll, I'll cast upstream a little bit. I like to fish my spay flies a little deeper, and I don't really like to fish sink tip. So I'll cast upstream just a little bit, let them settle before I start my swing. I'll just mend two or three times to get that fly as deep as I can get it. Uh, it's it's really simple Jock Scott grease line fishing when he talked about his deep method. Same deal. Fishing a floating line and letting them sink. Um, as far as head cements go, honestly, the sky's the limit. You do what you want to do. I don't use a lot of head cements. Um, I don't have a problem with it. Mick has a theory and has for a, doesn't use head cement. Believes it makes the fly, gives the fly a taste. It's a chemical thing in the water. Doesn't like it. I won't argue his point. The guy's got a lot more big trout out of a float tube than I ever will. So, you know, I, I think it's it has real merit to the point. If you want to use them, by all means use them. Uh, there's some really good water-based head cements out there now that I think probably have a a little better methodology than the, the lacquer-based ones that were so stinky. The ones we used to make ourselves were made out of hardwood floor finishing lacquers, and we had to wear a respirator to make the damn stuff. It was horrible. It was nasty. So, you know, use the, heck, use super glue if you want to. I mean, it works great. If you want to hold them together forever, it, it'll do it. Pardon me? Well, that, there again, as far as simulating something, I couldn't put my finger on anything. And I, I don't know that there's a steelhead fly out there that most people fish. At least western steelheaders don't target fish like eastern steelheaders do. I mean, you guys back there, you'll fish hex nymphs, you'll fish, you, you tell me. I, I know some of the stuff you fish that they're really impersonistic, matching something that's in the water. Very often we don't. Like I say, this orange one will be my go-to if, if I'm in water that's got October caddis and I know the fish are looking the grand drawing in September and October when those big caddis are hatching and they are almost that orange and they're almost scary when they come across the water that you, they, they look like a bat man they're a big bug that, that's my go to fly but I don't fish it dry I fish it just under the surface just let it skate, swing along if I can get it to make a ripple in the top I think sometimes I get better responses but I also think that's just because I get to see them take it if it gets deeper, they eat it. But I think orange is a trigger at that time of year. I think the browns and purples with a, with a hot butt on them like this, it's just a good winter color. Uh, it's just like early in the spring when the water's cold, your bass guys are going to go with their purples and blacks. Uh, the old rule of thumb on steelhead flies was, well, it really doesn't much, much matter what color your fly is as long as it's black. If you had to start out somewhere every day or if you'd only have one in your box, it'd still be a damned old black skunk. I mean, that... That fly catches fish. You keep it in the water long enough, and it's going to catch it. Um, you guys want to see anything different? You want me to do something? I'm running out of inspiration. Um, we can do a different wing style here. I'll do a D-wing for you. Pretty straight. Right, yep, green butts. George and, Harvey. Right, George Harvey was a, a great one for pink butts. He really was, yep. I don't even know how long I'm supposed to do this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. Now, when am I supposed to quit? Oh, I am. Okay. Oh. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll hammer one more out here. Okay, all right. Well, they started me late, so... These guys need to get their money's worth. Yep. All run long. <laughs> All right, you two. I don't need any hecklers. Thank you very much. They don't. Another color that I like really well that you don't see that much of is blue. And this one, I fish quite a bit. You want me to quit? How about you, Jack? You want me to quit? 
damn it, you're supposed to say yes. This is a pretty simple one. We're going to do it. Um, for fall fish, most of the time out here we fish a one, one to a three. Um, and there again, I know you guys fish a lot smaller hooks. Uh, no reason not to. You know, that one there, I'm going to use this, this uh, embroidery yarn. It's a little coarser, rougher stuff. I'm not going to worry quite so much about my... Uh, my body there so I just wound that on. Now this one, I'm going to tie my hackle in a little different. It's all prepped and ready to go here. I'm going to wrap this body up. Maybe. It's all cotton my material split. That. I don't need it all anyway. I, I don't use a lot. Of, I don't on my steelhead flies at all, unless unless I'm tying presentation flies, and then I'll use a head lacquer just to get a nice shiny black head. I usually seal them with clear, and then I'll use a, a black over the top of that, and that gives me. A, and I I can build a real pretty head and seal it with clear, and it'll be fine. But it's a hell of a lot easier just to put a black lacquer over the top of it and have a real pretty head. And most people never look at them that close. Now, I'm going to tie this hackle in just like you were tying an elk hair caddis. I'm going to tie it in by the butt here in the front. Matter of fact, I'll reduce this one by half. I'll back up. Just because you can. A lot of the old spay fly guys will tell you they want their flies pretty sparse. So they reduced all their hackle by about half. They stripped one side. The coolest thing about it, learning a lot of spay fly stuff is going through those old books trying to figure out what the hell they were talking about because they were speaking the king's English. And it was like, I ain't got a clue. I... I'm going to do a spiral this back. Cut that on the point of that hook. Some days I missed old, miss old dull mustad hooks. I never cut my thread on them. We started getting sharper hooks. We cut our thread a lot more, didn't we, Mick? doing is binding down each wrap of that hackle with a wrap of this tinsel. And this is a this is an oval gold tinsel with a core in it. It's, it's one of the Lagartons. There's lots of good tinsels out there now. You can use wire. Gold wire makes a great tough rip. It's a little harder to deal with for some people, but it, it dang sure makes a tough tough fly. I try not to bind too many of the fibers down, try to go between them so they stay upright, look okay. And tie that rib down. Right here and cut that guy off. You can tell how much less hackle there is on that fly as opposed to these two that I didn't reduce. It's it's much much different. Now on this one, given the color scheme, now I'm gonna look here. See? Yeah, I do. These are teal flank. Once again from Wild Birds, I think he shot them.
I'm going to take this feather. I'm going to treat it the same way I did the other other duck. And any waterfowl feather will work as long as you pick those that aren't too heavily flued that will come apart and make a decent hackle. That's what you, you want your hackle to separate, you want your wings not to. So you can kind of gauge your feather choice by that. I'm going to tie this one in by the tip. And fold that back. And once again, that one, much like the golden pheasant did, that's going to leave kind of a clump in there. You can see that. I'm just going to reach down here and get rid of that. I'm going to fold this again using the smooth blade of my scissors and pull. A lot of what goes on when you're folding is the tension on the stem of the feather. You got to pull hard enough to keep it tight and let those scissors ride along the stem. But you can't pull hard enough to break it. See how that folded those back? And that comes in handy in a lot of your tying. Uh, you, you'll find places for that a lot of times. Okay, there we go. Put that one on there. See, that'll separate out. You got those nice, fine, tapered ends. Kind of stays with our color scheme a little better than the brown would have. We got the gray and the blue. Gives it a, a nice look. Now, did I set Maybe I did. Okay, well. Let's see what we can come up with here. Put two collars on this one. I don't want to do. You'll like this. You'll like this a lot. Why I didn't think of that a minute ago. Peacock breast feathers. And it's going to fit this blue really well. I don't know why I didn't think of that a minute ago. Try to pick a decent size one here. That one's pretty good. That one hasn't been cleaned well. I think this was a roadkill, if I remember correctly. Well, actually, I, I take that back. This bird was not a roadkill. We had a call from a neighbor that had a bunch of peacocks show up around. They wanted rid of them, so we went on a peacock safari. We did eat them. They were good. You can do them in your uh, deep fat fryer like your turkeys. They're not half bad. A little darker meat. They're okay. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to fold this peacock. And there's almost not a feather on a peacock that you can't tie flies with. They're pretty awesome. They got a lot of cool stuff. Everybody goes for the tail feathers, and I have to, but uh, man, them body feathers got some neat stuff going on. And their wings make a pretty good substitute for some of the old feathers you can't get anymore. You can uh, take those wing feathers and bleach them just a little bit and make a pretty good bustard sub substitute. If you look in your salmon fly books, they'll call for a lot of a lot of bustard feathers. Pretty hard to get. Some of them are impossible to get. Uh, those of them that you can find are probably not legal for you to own, so you're better off to find a good sub. And peacock works real well. Well, uh, one species of bustard is actually extinct, and the other one is on the CITES list, on the import list. So you, if you got a permit and can bring them in, you can own them, but you got to have permit. Like I'd have, I've got some, and I, I actually don't have a permit for it. It's some that I was given a number of years ago, and I can't bring it in public like this because if I get checked, they're going to take it away from me. You know, and I don't want to lose it. Hey, Clint, come here. The front of that piece there is out. Not the other. Uh, just pull the, the inners over to you. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, my assistant. Not so lovely. What I've got here are some pre made wings. And when I say pre made, I've already paired them up. Yes, sir. Okay, we'll let these guys decide. If they're sick and tired of me, I don't... 
this is peacock wing right here. And I've taken a right and a left, and I've paired them up. And what I do to prep these a little ahead of time is I just take thread and tie them together in my pairs. And then they're ready to go. It makes, it makes tying them on top quite simple. I'm about to sneeze, guys. Oh. Pardon me, cut that out. And these D-style wings, you want them to set right on top in a real nice V. And I do the same thing. I put the wing near me on top of the wing away from me. So when my thread passes over the top, it doesn't try to push a wing away. It tries to close them down over one another. And that worked really good. I sound surprised, don't I? Yeah, that's not too bad. That one laid on there really nice. And having them tied together like that makes trimming your butt ends off really simple. They're real clean and easy. Done deal. If you tie on the road, you know, if, if you're taking your stuff with you on the river and you're going to have it in the motel room or something or whatever, that makes having a few prepped up ready to go so you're not tying flies all night long the night before. If you got to go tie a couple for the box, having those wings prepped like that makes it really simple. As you can see, I don't truly properly use the rotary feature on my vise like a lot of guys do. I, I like the ability to turn my fly and look at a lot of different aspects of it, but I don't rotary tie that much. I can, I have. Um, if I get requests for it, I can do that. That's going to be funky. I don't like that. There we go. I almost caught some in my throat there, and it was going to be a be an ugly spot. I didn't want that very bad. Trim that dude off. And that one there is just a... That's one of those flies. I, I can't decide if I want to call it a bright fly or a dark fly. The blue body is a nice bright spot. The the, uh, the peacock gives it a little iridescent flash. So you got some bright in there. But it's got dark hackle and a fairly dark wing. It's one of those that I'd, I'd say on that just average old overcast day, I'd probably go to a fly like this. Where if it's a really dark overcast day, I'd probably go to a really dark fly. It's a really bright sunny day. I'd probably stay in the bar and drink beer. Uh, not not a fan of steelhead fishing on sunny days. But uh, as I said, is there anything else you guys want to see?